Amen. <laughs> I want to read this before I preach this morning. I'm sorry this has taken so long, but nevertheless, I appreciate so much all the cards, the flowers, and the visits while I was in the hospital and rehab. The nurses in rehab noticed the visits. One commented to me, you go to a large church, don't you? I told her, not really. That was a witness to them. I especially appreciate Sheila Bradley, who knew that I was alone and came after work and spent every night in the hospital with me. It was very comforting. I especially thank you for the prayers of the church. I'm sure that is why the surgery turned out so well as it did. My doctor even said it was a miracle that a tumor that big had not metastasized. Please continue to pray it does not come back and pray for salvation for my children and grandchildren. Thank you, Marilyn Von Mann. God bless you. And thank the good Lord for the witness and testimony and for the fact that he's brought her through. Amen. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to book of Revelation with me this morning, please. Revelation chapter number 1. And verse number 10. Revelation 1, 10. This is what's called the Apocalypse, folks. And the Apocalypse is used all the time in the secular world to refer to a cataclysmic event. That's how they use it, but that's not what the word means. The word apocalypse means an unveiling, an opening up, a revelation. This is why it's called the revelation, because it reveals the future. Revelation 1, verse number 10. The Apostle John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book. Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Father, I pray now that you bless your holy word as it goes forth, for the purpose that you intend it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. I've been blessed to know Brother Bob Bevington. How many of you folks knew Brother Bob Bevington? Amen. An outstanding man, a fine man, a man of God who for years, decades in this town, was a, was a faithful witness of the Word of God and led, no doubt, I don't know how many idea, how many people that he won to the Lord and that by his witness and his life helped them grow in the Lord. And I was, I was privileged to go to the Holy Land on four, maybe five different occasions with Brother Bevington, but one in particular stands out, and that's the one when we went into Turkey. Because in Turkey, we went to the seven churches of Asia Minor. We were able to go visit these locations that are recorded in the Bible. That was a very, very rewarding, instructional time. But you will not find churches. The sad thing is, if you go throughout Asia Minor, go throughout Turkey, you will not find the churches except in one place. That's Smyrna. And it's called Ishmir, Turkey, to this day. And Smyrna is where Polycarp, the old man of God, was martyred for his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a church house there. We went into the church and looked at it. They've got, they've got paintings of uh, Polycarp and all of that, and the great history that's associated with the, with the ministry and with the witness that has been there for 2,000 years. But the rest of them just open fields. Laodicea, I distinctly remember, when we got to where Laodicea had once stood, it was just an open field with some big stones piled up here and there, lizards running all over the place. That's what I remember about Laodicea, nothing there. Just emptiness. We'd go into some towns and we'd go to the place where the church building or the church house, they say, had once stood. Nothing there. All gone. But 2,000 years ago, when the book of Revelation was written, seven churches existed in Asia Minor. These are churches that had believers in them, just like you and just like me. They were the church of the living God. And these, these letters are addressed to these churches and to the people in the churches. And it's very important to understand that there's a lot of things to be gleaned from this that help us to understand first century Christianity. Because in the first century you had Pergamos, where Satan's seat was located. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. That place now, of course, is Pergamum. And you, it's still there. You can visit Pergamum. And it's quite a thing to see there 
what is located in that place at Pergamon. But there's no church house there. But what you do find is an amphitheater, the, 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 Ru the Roman ruins, and a sclepius. You'll find the, uh, the, uh, the, I forget the other term for it, the twisted serpent that goes up the staff that represents the healing. It's there. That's where it was born, apparently. And that's where it was disseminated throughout all the world. A place, a place of a great library as large as the library at Alexandria, Egypt, that was destroyed and burned. And to this day, the historians lament the fact that the library in Alexandria was lost. Pergamon was a seat of learning. All of these things are found in the first, in the first century after Christ, the seven churches of Asia Minor. Our witness and our testimony, folks, goes back a long way. We didn't start yesterday. No. We weren't born yesterday. The church of God has been here since Christ said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Make no mistake about it, folks. It makes no difference. It's as, as relevant as it can be who happens to be in power or what government or what country or what culture that you're a part of. His church will be here until He comes to call it out of this world to meet Him in the clouds and in the air. I'm glad. Hallelujah. I'm part of that church. Glory to God, my name. He said, don't rejoice because demons are subject to you. He said, that's in the course of events. That's just part of being a Christian. He said, but rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Amen. My name's up there. And those uh, seven sons of Sceva, these, uh, these exorcists over there in the book of Acts, when they, when they tried to cast the demons out of someone, they said, We adjure thee by Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out of them. And the demons came out and leapt on them and beat them up and left them naked. And they were running away. And the demons said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know. Who are you? In plain of words, they know who Jesus is in hell. And they know who Paul is in hell. Amen. And they know who you are if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ today. Hallelujah to God. Amen. So these seven churches represent churches that were in existence 2,000 years ago. But all Scripture has more than one application. And here we have a historical application, a practical application, a spiritual application. And today I want to talk to you about the progressive revelation that we'll find in the seven churches of Asia Minor. Because if you lay them down and superimpose them over the 2,000 years of church history, you'll find a remarkable coincidence of how these churches relate to certain periods of time. And so this is what I'm going to go through with you for quickly, and then we'll move on. The church at Ephesus that he mentions in chapter number 2 represents the apostolic period. In other words, the first century, from A.D. 33 up to 200 A.D., the church of Smyrna represents the martyred church from 200 to 325 A.D. The church at Pergamos is the imperial church from 325 to 500 A.D. The church at Thyatira is the medieval church from 500 to 1000 A.D. The church of Sardis is the persecuted church, 1000 to 1500 A.D. You should be fully aware of the pogrom that was executed against the church and of the Inquisition and all of that. Then the Church of Philadelphia is the Re Reformation Church, 1500 to 1900 A.D. These are general dates. The Church of Philadelphia was the only church that he said out of the seven that has kept the word of my patience. And he said, because you've kept my word, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation that shall try the whole world. That tells me that doctrinally, He's coming for those that look for His appearing. Are you looking for His appearing? If you are, you're part of the church of Philadelphia. And the word Philadelphia is the, con is the conjunction of two words. Phileo and Adelphos. Phileo is one of the words in Greek for love. Adelphos is the Greek word for man. So it is brotherly love, or the love of mankind, that we have one for another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you build big buildings. That's not it, is it? By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have this great ecclesiastical hierarchy. No. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Burning, sacrificial love. 
that you have for the brethren. Nothing could be greater on this earth. You will find, dear friend, that the greatest treasure that you will ever possess on this planet will be when you find true love. And that is, cannot be bought. It is not sold. It is not in the marketplace. But it, true love is one of the most blessed things that a human being can ever have in their life. And if you are right with God, you have the seeds of true love planted in your soul. And in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, the definition of true love, this is the Bible definition of true love, transcends all of the gobbledygook and garbage that you hear spewed out today, and that it rises head and shoulders above everything that Sacco Babble will tell you. True love is a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. For this is love, not that we loved Him, but that He loved us. And He gave His life on the cross as they sang about just a few minutes ago. No greater love hath any man than a man will lay down his life for his friends. Our Lord Jesus Christ proved that at the cross. But the final church is the church of Laodicea. Historically, the church of Laodicea is from 1900 to the present time. The church of Laodicea is the church of the rights of the people. That's what the word means. It means the rights of the people over the authority of God. It means the sovereignty of the human spirit trumps the sovereignty of God. It means that man elevates himself above the authority of Almighty God. You are cursed to live in that generation. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. I had no choice in the matter. I live in the age of Laodicea. I live in the age of self-love. In 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 1, the apostle says this. 2 Timothy 3, 1. That in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. And then what follows is a litany of all of the characteristics that you encounter every single day of your life. The minute you walk out of this house today, you are going to be walking in the midst of people that are absolutely and completely consumed with themselves. That's all they think about is themselves. And this is why self-love is preached from the pulpits in America to this day. Let me tell you one more time. Your problem is not a lack of self-love. Your problem is sin. And the only thing that can take care of sin is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The only thing, the only thing is the blood of the Son of God. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 3 says they love themselves. He says they're covetous, boasters, and proud. This categorizes people that we know today. They're like that. Can you imagine somebody who listens to the filth on radio? Can you imagine some of the talk shows in this country? And I'm talking about the filthy four-letter blasphemous words that are spewed day in and day out. And yet a jaded crowd like that says, I say something to offend them. Amen. Amen. Oh, boy. Oh, let's get a hold of this. Let's get a touch of reality today. You mean to tell me that your ears that hear this day in and day out and you're offended because I may preach something from the pulpit? No, no, my dear friend. Don't tell me that. There's nothing going to offend you if you have allowed yourself to swallow, lick, eat, and digest sewage all week long. Don't get mad at a preacher when he preaches the Bible to you. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. We live in a generation that kills babies. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. Partial birth abortion. I, I have a problem sometimes digging too deep. And I saw a picture this morning of a little baby in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a bowl. Uh, some kind of a metal bowl. And this little baby was not much bigger than my hand. And this little thing was dead, and it had been aborted from its mother's womb. 
It had been taken, and I saw the little thing all twisted up like this, and I felt so sorry. I felt so sorry for a helpless little baby that had been jerked out of its mother's womb and had been murdered because some politician says a woman has a right to her body. And you tell me you're offended with what I say? We live in a bloody country. Did you know that over a million abortions are performed in this country every year? Did you know that there are over 34 million abortions performed in this world every year? Do you realize how bloody this world is right now with the shedding of the blood of the innocent little babies that haven't done anything to anybody? Now let me put something on this for you. Did you know now that technology, DNA technology... These guys are getting deep into this stuff. Do you realize now they've gotten to the point to where they can reproduce in 3D what somebody may look like that from the DNA? Do you realize today that they can take the DNA? I'm talking about the very code of the cell. That's the code. That's where all the knowledge is coded in that DNA. And they can take that and project about what that child is going to look like when it's 20 years old. On his wedding day, this girl or this boy, when they get married, can you imagine? Can you imagine? At the great white throne judgment of God as they're lined up as far as the eye can see. And God has them there as a witness. Look at them. There are, they are, they're by the millions. And they're not little aborted babies. They're 20 years old. Can you imagine the moms and the dads as they have to walk down through there and come face to face with the one they aborted? And that 20-year-old looks at them and says, I'm the one you killed. I was your daughter. I was your son. Oh, you say, preacher, you're dramatizing something. Ain't no way. Don't tell me there's no way. Don't tell me there wasn't a reason for that baby to be born. Don't tell me that baby was conceived as simply an accident. Don't tell me that there's not value that God puts on human life. Let me tell you something, too. This is for those of you who live by skin for skin. So what's that, preacher? That's what the devil said in the book of Job. He said, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin. Most people, that's all they live for, their own skin. But let me tell you something for those of you who live skin for skin. If they'll take a baby out of its mother's womb, kill that little innocent child, they will Kill you. Don't kid yourself. If you are so cold and indifferent to a little baby, they will put you to death and go sit down and have supper when they're done. That day's coming. No, it's not. It's already here. So, yes, we live in that time. Just a few weeks ago, I went up to Kentucky to see the ark. And I still haven't gotten over it. It overwhelmed me. It was a magnificent structure. And I, I, if, I, if I could recommend anything to you, go see it. It's not that far from here. In Williamstown, Kentucky, go see the ark. It's sitting up there. It's a marvelous thing. And when I went in there and saw it, I stood back and photographed it and photographed it. Then I went in and I saw it and I came out of there. Blessed the Lord of mercy. I was ready to jump up and down and shout. I was ready to run all over the place. It had, it had blessed my soul. I thought, hallelujah, Noah, man, you're a builder, son. Good night. 120 years he was at building that. Didn't take them near as long. But Noah didn't have all that stuff they've got. When I looked at that, I got home and I started reading about the ark on the Internet. Especially this ark up there in Williamstown, Kentucky. You wouldn't believe the atheists and the agnostics come out of the woodwork. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The myth. The myth. The myth. The myth. The myth. They cannot stand the idea that the ark is real. And so they feel sorry for all these poor deluded fools up here that put all that money into building the ark. No, you're the deluded fool. That ark floated at one time across the face of the waters. And that's what the Bible says. And that ark is the type of the Lord Jesus Christ who will carry you from the old world into the new world. Hallelujah. And but it inspired me. It inspired me. I think, I'll tell you the truth. I believe I could move up there and just move in. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> just move in. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, sir. Chapter number 3 and verse number 3 of Second Timothy says, Without natural affection... And I thought to myself, my goodness gracious, 
Paul, you knew exactly what it was going to be like today without natural affection. And the latest absurdity to come down the, the PC insane pack is this. Gender fluidity. Gender fluidity. Ladies, this is not coming. It's here. Be careful when you go to the bathroom. Be careful, ladies, when you go to the bathroom. Man, you got nothing to worry about. <laughs> men are men. <laughs> Always been men. Ladies, you got, listen. Ladies, you got nothing to worry about from a man. A pervert, yeah, but not a man. A man, according to the Scripture, will protect you, ladies. He'll fight for you. He'll stand his ground for you. That's what a man will do, and you ladies know that. But when you walk into the bathroom now, be careful. You're liable to see some bearded pervert come in there. And that bearded pervert went to bed the night before as a man. He got up the next day as a woman. And if he changes his mind sometime during the day, he's either a woman or he's a man. That's called fluid gender. Gender fluidity. You say, well, that's insane. You ought to be locked up. No. The government, the American Psychiatric Association... The same crowd that said that if you believe in the second coming and you believe in conspiracies, you're dangerous to the government. They said that about you, but it's okay if you don't know whether you're a male or a female five minutes from now. You say you're blowing it out of proportion. No, I'm not, friend. That is the mark of an insane culture. You, now listen, listen. You live in an insane culture. How many of you would go to an insane asylum and try to sit down across the table from that person and carry on a sensible conversation? It's not that you're mocking these people. I'm not mocking. I feel sorry for people, especially somebody who's got problems of losing their mind. That's no joke. That's horrible because you've lost the person. But you try to sit down and carry on a con. I wouldn't waste my time to try to do that. You're not talking to somebody that can talk to you with, with, with uh, to be cognizant of what you're saying with sensibility and, and give you answers. No. It's the same thing with this liberal bunch of murdering devils today. You cannot talk to them. There was a time 40, 50 years ago when there was a dialogue. And they kept talking about, we need to talk about these things. We need to understand these things. Not anymore. No. They've got the power now, and they're going to ram it down your throat. It's going to be their way or the highway. How many of you know that? This country has two poles, and it is as divided as it could possibly be. And neither side is going to give up their position. I'm sure not going to give up mine. There is no middle ground. They're not going to get me to come over to kill babies. They're not going to get me to come over to tell men that are a woman, man one minute and a woman the next minute and then a man again. I'm not going to accept that. It's not going to happen. Something has got to be done for America. It's sad, but it's real. So, the Bible says they have a form of godliness. But they deny the power thereof. In the form of godliness, mega churches, mega this, mega that. And to me, it's nothing but a mega mess. Amen. That's all it is. A mega mess. What a sad, sad thing. But they deny the power thereof. What is the power? The power is three things. The cross, the blood, and the blessed hope. When you preach the cross to people, you separate them. You can't preach the cross without separating people from the world. For the Apostle Paul said that I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. By saying that, he meant to say, for you to understand, I'm as dead to this world as he was dead to this world. That's what it means. When you preach the cross, you preach a dividing line. You separate people. One from the other. One pole from the other pole. If you preach the blood, you preach the New Testament. There are a lot of preachers going around that preach the Sermon on the Mount. That's all you hear out of them. You may need to be good to this one, do this for that one. You may need to be good over here and good here and goody, goody and goody, goody, good, 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 good. And they think that's preaching the New Testament. 
Now, how many of you in this house this morning know what the New Testament is? I mean, I preached it till I'm blue in the face. The New Testament is not a book. The New Testament is not a doctrine. The New Testament is not a catechism. The New Testament is certainly not a church. What is it? He took the cup of blood and a cup of wine and he said, This is the New Testament in my blood. If you preach the New Testament, you're going to preach the blood of Christ. If you preach righteousness, you're going to preach the blood of Christ. If you preach sanctification, you're going to preach the blood of Christ. If you preach salvation, you're going to preach the blood of Christ. If you're going to preach the body of Christ, you're going to preach the blood of Christ. Therefore, if you're going to preach the church, you're going to preach the blood of Christ. If you're going to preach the salvation or the forgiveness of sins, you're going to preach the blood of Christ. Amen. It boils down to this. You cannot preach anything about your relationship with God and the salvation of your soul that is not directly connected with the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. Everything I am forever hope to be glory to God is connected with the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, for some reprobate reverend to get up in the pulpit and to say, I'm not going to preach a bloody religion, he's screaming to the top of his lungs, you don't know him. You've never been born again. What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? The Apostle Paul said, I came knowing nothing among you, but Christ and Him crucified. When I preached the cross, I preached the blood that was shed at the cross. And it was there that a dying sinner met a Savior that could save his soul. It's all about the blood, folks. Amen. You can come along with your psycho babble and talk about a bloody religion or slaughterhouse religion. Let me tell you something. When you're swinging out over hell, you'll wish to the Lord God that you had that blood covering your sins. You'll wish that that blood had forgiven you and cleansed you. Self-righteousness is one of the worst sins a man can commit. Self-righteousness is when you say to God, I'm good enough by my own works. I'm keeping the law. I'm keeping this, keeping that. I'll be okay. Just, uh, just, just give me enough time. I'll perfect it in the flesh. And the flesh cannot perfect anything. And you could never be good enough to go to heaven lest Christ died in vain. Nothing but the blood. The blood of Jesus. And the third thing is this. Hallelujah. We preach the power of God, the cross, the blood, and the blessed hope. Listen, you can hear him coming. Can't you feel it? Well, preacher, you know something. I believe if the church just really does its job and does what it's supposed to do, we'll convert the world. No, you won't. The world's already converted you. You say, well, preacher, doesn't the gospel of the kingdom have to be preached before the Lord Jesus comes back? I don't preach the gospel of the kingdom to you. If you don't know the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God, you need to go back to Theology 101. You say, what do you mean? Is there a difference? Absolutely. When the Lord Jesus Christ was here, He sent them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And He preached the gospel of the kingdom. And He preached the gospel of the kingdom of heaven to the Jewish people and offered them Messiah. And they rejected Him. And the Apostle Paul, when God called him, said, He said, I went to the head of the church in Jerusalem to take the gospel I preach, lest I had run in vain, and compare it with what they were preaching. God gave him that gospel in Arabia, probably the same place that he gave Moses, the tables of stone. It would make sense that he went to the top of Sinai, as Moses did. And when he came back from Sinai, he came back with a New Testament in his hand. Amen. Amen. He came back with the biggest part of the New Testament, and he began to write it down and preach the gospel of the grace of God. You say, is there a difference in the gospels? What about that one in the book of Revelation, where the Bible says, I saw an angel fly through the heaven, and he was preaching the everlasting gospel. And have you read what that gospel was? There's nothing in there about the grace of God. Gospel simply means good news. 
And it's the good news for a certain people at a certain age and a certain place. Yes, it is. When Moses preached the gospel back there to the children of Israel, here was the gospel. Get back away from this mountain. If you touch this mountain, you're going to die. In the book of Hebrews, the writer says that that gospel, the mountain was on fire and it was shaking. And if you approached it, you could die on the spot. Now, he reached up to the top in the temple and he ripped it from top to bottom. And he opened up the way. And now it's Jew and it's Gentile. There's no longer a Gentile court. It's Jew and it's Gentile. And you can come directly to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hallelujah. Red man, black man, yellow man, white man, rich man, poor man, bond man, free man. Whoever you are, wherever you are. The gospel of the grace of God is this. You came in this house laden with sins. Cursed to hell, fire, and damnation. But you can come to the altar where Christ tasted your death. And there at that altar you can receive Him as your Savior. And He'll save you and write your name in the Lamb's book of life. And He doesn't care who you are, where you came from, how much money you got in the bank. Whether you're an American or an Italian or an African, it makes no difference. The Lord Jesus is the Savior of all men. The Bible said He would have all men to be saved. Amen. He's the Savior. Listen to this. The Bible says He is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. All men. Hallelujah. Even so come. Lord Jesus, come. M. R. Dahan. You know what he's got on his tombstone. M. R. Dahan was a doctor. A medical doctor. God called him to preach. The last thing he gave, gave out as a witness, they put it on his tombstone, and it simply says, maybe today. You go to Cage Cove, you go back up there where the split is, halfway. You all know where I'm talking about? You got the grist mill. All right, there's a little graveyard over there, halfway at Cage Cove, little graveyard. So it's back off to the side. I walked out in that graveyard one day. I like to read tombstones. You'd be amazed at some of the things that you get on a tombstone. I walked up to one tombstone, looked down, it said this. It said, to die is eternal life. Why should we weep? That was written by pioneers. Life wasn't easy. Life wasn't easy. To die is eternal life. Why should we weep? The apostle said to be absent, present with the Lord. So I got it made both ways. If I drop right here in front of you before my body hits the ground, I'll be looking at stuff that'll blow your mind. Ha! Woo! Ha! You can't beat that. But what if you hear the trumpet? Ha! Man. To meet him in the clouds. I, 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 I'd like to see that. <laughs> That's just the curious nature about me. Man, take that in, would you? Millions of them appear in the clouds. All of a sudden, come up hither. You hear that sound? Shake. Reach all the way into the graves. And the Bible says they are dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. It's coming home. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So you can't beat it. Amen. Walk over here. Take a step down. Body hits the floor, and I'm going up. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going about my business sometime, not even thinking about it, and all of a sudden, trumpet. Yeah. Bang. Amen. We're gone. Amen. Can't beat that. So you're a crazy preacher. I'm happy. <laughs> I am happy. I am. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> hey, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for taking an old sorry dog like me, saving my soul. Father, for what time I've got left on this world, Lord, for what time I have here, you, you know. I don't know. You know. And that's fine with me. I don't need to know. You know. May every day of it, may every breathing second moment of it, may the time you give me, may it be lived and done and used for the glory of God. 
In the times that I stand in the pulpit, I pray, Father, that this life will be given to Thee. Not about me. Lord, it's not about me. It's about Thee. In Thy righteous name I pray. Amen.